Scared to death, and the ground is shaking. This is for everyone that complained in part one that the surfaces on these beds were different. Okay, so in this video we're going to do some more advanced tests on these heated beds. I got a lot of good feedback from the last one, so I scrapped the entire second part that I had already filmed and voiceovered and did it all again, but better, I hope. So let's go through what I changed. Um, the first obvious one is that I painted all these beds in the same matte black paint. I'm not sure if I'm ever going to get this paint off the PEI surfaces again, but hey, there's signs, and yes, this is one of the coated Prusa PEI sheets, but it's one of the very first generation ones, and this top side was starting to show some of the flaws those older beds had, like the markings uh, starting to come off, so it's fine, don't, don't worry about it. But why did I paint all these in the first place? It's about emissivity, because I'm looking at these with a thermal camera. Yes, this is a camera, it's just in a different wavelength. Um, if the surface is reflective, I'm not actually going to pick up the temperature of the part itself, but the temperature of whatever is being reflected. Just like when you look in a mirror, uh, you don't see the mirror itself, but you see the reflection of yourself. And having a matte paint is just going to give really good and consistent results. Now, there were a few suggestions to use tapes or grease or other stuff that would be more easily removable, but I wanted a really thin layer that was thermally really well coupled to the surface and paint was what I had available. The next suggestion was to take photos instead of video with the FLIR 1 camera attachment. And yes, I did do that for part 2, and that's because the JPEGs you get out of the FLIR camera app aren't just a static photo, they actually contain so much more information than what the image is showing you, and you can then take the JPEG and take it into FLIR tools, the software you can run on your computer, and analyze the data to your heart's content. And we will do that today. And lastly, I know Stefan, Stefan from CNC Kitchen does charts really well, and you guys want to see some charts on these data that I'm generating, so yes, I made charts in Google Docs. If you guys know how Linus Tech Tips or Gamers Nexus make their actually really nice charts, uh, let me know in the comments below, eh? Alright, so what are we testing today? Three things. Again, th three. Uh, the first one is actually not using a thermal camera at all, but a dial gauge. So in 2013, I had finally figured out why the first layer of my prints would always peel off from the rest of the print. And it was because when the bed temperature changed during the print, say with a hotter first layer and then dropping the temperature for the rest of the print, it would warp by a lot and actually act as a lift for the entire print and move it away from the nozzle. The side with the heating traces uh, would get so much hotter than the non-heated side that it would expand and physically warp the bed by about as much as a full layer height. That's crazy! But to a small extent, you'd also get issues if during the print the bed keeps bouncing up and down as it tries to regulate its temperature. The next test today is looking at those temperatures and how even everything looks with those newly painted surfaces. I've got the min, max and average temperatures of these beds in their full extent, and then with a 2 cm safety margin from the usually cooler edges, uh, and took those right after they had heated up, which is when typically the print would start, and also 5 minutes later to hopefully give it some time to settle in. And lastly, I think this is a really fun one, I'm going to use this fan to simulate a part cooling fan blowing over the bed. We look into how quickly and how much it cools down the surface of the bed, which is, of course, where your part should stick, and also how quickly that surface temperature recovers when we take the fan back off. And remember, while these tests are done with specific printers, the goal is to show which bed assemblies work and which don't, so I've picked these exact printers, you know, three more that I don't have on this table, um, to have a big variety of bed stack ups, and you should be able to transfer what we're learning from these beds to get a sense of how other beds should perform. That's also the reason why I'm not using each printer's own part cooling fan, uh, they would just have been way too different to draw any reasonable conclusion from them. Just to recap, 
These are the contenders and their stackups. The Ultimaker 3 with glass clamped over an aluminum heater PCB. The Ender 3 with a thicker aluminum PCB, no glass, but a Biltech clone sticker on top. The Prusabark 3 with a thick FR4 glass fiber, heater PCB and a magnetically held down PEI coated steel sheet on top. The Low Spot Mini first generation with a silicone heater mat uh, stuck to the bottom of a glass sheet and then a PEI sheet stuck to the top and the Sigma R17 with a PCB heater and the glass sheet suspended over it. Let's get going with the warping test. Okay, for this test I'm going to show you one printer in full detail and then go through the rest of the machines a bit quicker and then show you the graphs that I made. Very pretty graphs. Let's start with the Ultimaker again, because I think this is the one that is the closest to what one would expect. I've always tried to set the indicator to as close to zero uh, as I could at the start and then set the bed temperature to 60 degrees. As the bed heats up, we can see that the needle is starting to move to the left, which means the bed is actually dipping down, moving away from the nozzle. And that makes sense. If you have a sheet that heats up on the bottom, that bottom side expands more than the colder top side, so you get that bowl effect with the center moving down. Now, I didn't measure the exact center, but always a bit off. The Prusa has a screw in the center right there where its PCB is mounted to the undercarriage, so we wouldn't see much warping there. But also the arm I was using for the indicator just wasn't long enough to reach the center on most of these beds. So for the Ultimaker 3, it first starts bowing down at the point where the temperature difference between the hot bottom and the cooler top reaches an equilibrium. The warp evens out too, and once the bed is completely heated up, it springs back towards where it started because now the heater is not working at full blast anymore. So the bottom doesn't have that oversupply of heat anymore, but also the top is getting a chance to equalize in temperature. Now, at this point, if the heater of the bed wouldn't be just constantly supplying a bit of heat to maintain temperature, but would instead completely shut down for a while, if you want, say, a lower bed temperature, or if it would completely turn on again to raise the bed temperature, then we would see a very similar warp cycle again. So that's the Ultimaker. The Low Spot Mini is very similar, but with way less warp. The Sigma is interesting though, uh, because it wasn't giving me consistent results. I tested the printers several times and all of them were very close from one run to the next. But the Sigma kept doing weird stuff. The first try saw a curve like what we had with the Ultimaker, but with about twice as much warp, and subsequent runs had this kink in the curve where for the first half of the heat up time it would warp downwards and then start warping up again. In either case, the delta between the minimum and the maximum deflection was similarly large though. Now, the Prusa is the only machine with its heating traces on the top side of the heater, so it bows upwards as it heats and back down as it cools. And because it's FR4 glass fiber, it does warp quite a lot, and due to how the glass fiber is laid in the PCB, it also just straight up expands more in the Z direction versus its XY plane as its temperature increases, so that bump is expected. Once it is up to temp, of course, it warps back downwards, but that movement is not as much as the other beds. One thing that's also interesting is the Ender 3, because there's actually not much warp at all, other than when the heater shuts off at the end, but during heat up, there's like nothing happening. Once again shows that all aluminum beds are not a bad idea at all. And let's look at the entire process as a graph. First, let's stick to anything that's happening during heat up until the printers read 60 degrees. Here we can see that the Ender and the Lulzpot Mini don't move much, while the Ultimaker dips down a lot, the Prusa bounces up a lot, and the Sigma just goes crazy. If we extend the graph to include that last bit, where I let the bed settle in for a bit at full temperature, we see that almost all beds end up higher up than where they started. I looked into whether that last notch, that last kicker, could have been the dial indicator just heating up and expanding, but it doesn't get significantly warmer during this entire process. Also, Prusa's bed did warp down in the end, so ultimate, ultimately I believe this last blip is not a fluke in the data. Alright, next test. How even is the temperature? Now, I already did a similar measurement in part 1, but let's dive a bit deeper this time. So what I did is I basically went through in Fleur tools and set the range for all these images to be the same. So the same colors mean the same temperatures in each and every single photo. Black is 50 degrees Celsius or colder, white 
is 75 degrees Celsius or hotter. These beds were all set to 60 degrees and that temperature is represented as bright pink. Red is a bit warmer and bluish purple is a bit cooler, but only by a degree or two. The spottiness that you can see here is the overlay from the second visible light camera in the FLIR 1, but we can turn that off. Most of the time it doesn't align well anyways. Yes, you can adjust the offset in the app, but I'd have to tweak that for every single photo and it wasn't consistent, but we can still use it for scale. You can see the ruler that I included in every photo. And that's centimeter markings. I also tried to get a photo from as square onto the surface as possible so that I can use the box tool in FLIR tools, which shows the minimum, average and maximum temperature within that bounding box. So I went through all these images, measured as much of the usable bed area as possible without including the cold background, then scooted in by two centimeters, took the same measurement and then did the same for the image that I took after five minutes when the printer had settled in a bit. So let's go through the printers because they all have their specialties. And the Ultimaker is actually the least special of these. Its heated bed, again, reads the most consistent of all printers, but it did have to crop out the top and bottom edge where the clips are, and technically that's still a printable area. Like most beds, it was actually hotter when it first reached its set temperature and then settled back down. But again, it's, it's really unspectacular. It's just, it's good. Moving on to the Ender, which is actually very much on par with the Ultimaker as far as consistency goes. Again, you see those four spots where the bed is mounted, but other than that, it's actually really good. The Prusher clearly makes use of its different power zones during heat up, and here you can see both the nine screw locations, which wick away heat, as well as the four calibration spots where no heat is being generated in the first place. That means it does have rather cold corners, and that single cold spot in the center. But then again, for small parts, it should still be fine. It's just that larger parts shouldn't extend all the way to the edges. After having painted the bed, the spottiness I initially saw in the first video is also gone. So that probably was just some wear or dirt on the surface that changed the emissivity. But if we move on to the second image, five minutes in, we can see that the entire bed has cooled down quite a lot. This is probably just the overshoot from the first like PID ripple, but while for example the low spot mini is initially overshooting 60 degrees by a lot and then settling back down, the pusher just hits those 60 degrees and then drops down from that. We still see a similar pattern as before where the corners are actually way cooler, but that ring pattern from the very power bed is now turned into a hotter center spot like most other beds. Next, some more details on the low spot mini. Same pattern we saw in round one. It's still way too hot. It still has that massive cold spot left center where the heated bed's leads are connected and where the thermistor sits, but because it's so hot, the edges are also quite warm and usable. The pattern we saw right after heat up dissipates a bit after those five minutes and the temperatures are much more in line with where they should be, but overall it's still an oddball. And lastly, the Sigma, you should definitely let this printer settle in after it reached temperature, but even then you're still only getting a rather small area of the bed where it's at least 50 degrees Celsius. Interestingly, instead of 60 degrees, the Sigma only lets you preheat to 65 degrees Celsius. Maybe that's their way of offsetting for this. Oh yeah, charts, uh, here we go. You can pause the video at any time if you want to take a longer look. First up, the temperatures right as the printer read 60 degrees Celsius for the first time for both the entire bed and the inner area, about two centimeters away from the edges. Generally, the more spread out the temperatures are for each printer, the less consistent the temperatures are. I thought about whether it makes sense to only look at the delta between the average and the maximum, but ultimately decided to leave these data more open for your interpretations. So this graph was immediately when the printer had heated up. Now let's look at the temperatures after five minutes of settling in. And you can see that most printers now have a more even temperature distribution as expected. Also keep an eye on the differences between the entire bed measured and the inner values as those tell you how usable the extremities of the bed actually are. Okay, so lastly, the fan test. This thing was actually really interesting to design. I wanted to use a 40 millimeter fan, 40 millimeter axial fan, and designed this nozzle, I actually just broke the leg off. Uh, and this nozzle was supposed to focus this airflow into one spot on the bed. Uh, this first design, this one, did absolutely nothing. It had the fan spinning, but there was no air coming out the other side. Um, 
I could blow through it just fine, I still can. You know, it gives a nice airstream, but the fan wouldn't move any air. And that was because I had basically created a whirlpool in here where the air was just swirling around so fast it was pushing out and upwards more than the fan was pushing down. That was a fun one to figure out. So I added some static blades in here um, and now it's it's super focused. It's almost like we have laminar flow through the nozzle. It's pretty, it's pretty good. So I had these beds equalized for five minutes and now I just placed the already spinning fan onto the center of the bed and recorded how quickly these beds cooled off. The color scale in these recordings is different to what you just saw and it's even changing during the clip. So the same colors don't necessarily also mean the same temperatures. It's just really finicky to set that up in the app. So Ultimaker 3, the Ultimaker 3 is actually doing decently here in comparison. I think the two important values are how much it cools down within those 10 seconds, which is kind of a short term or instant cool down when you know, the part cooling fan brushes over a spot and how much it cools down after 60 seconds, which you could also use as reference for how sensitive these types of beds are if you have a draft or some fan inside the printer unintentionally blowing over the bed. The Ultimaker cools from 62 degrees initially to 52.4 degrees after 10 seconds and 44 degrees Celsius after 60 seconds. Remember, the printer is still set to heat the bed to 60 degrees Celsius, but it may not notice that drop fast enough to do anything about it since the sensor is typically on the other side of the bed assembly. You can also see the shadow the legs of the fan pod cast, which, I don't know, doesn't really show anything, but it's, it's still fun to see. When I take off the fan, the Ultimaker slowly recovers to 54.4 degrees after 30 seconds. I also took readings after just one second of removing the fan because I noticed that some printers actually recovered significantly faster than those first 10 seconds. Not the Ultimaker though. So the Sigma is basically identical here to the Ultimaker, but recovers more slowly. The Little Spot Mini is also very similar, but it loses more temperature, but also recovers more temperature within the first few seconds of taking the fan off. This I attribute to the Little Spot instead of having a plain glass sheet, it has that PEI film that acts as a weak insulator, letting the very top layer cool down more quickly, but also insulating the inner glass sheet from the cooling effects of the fan. Is this a good thing? Not sure. The Ender 3 is actually really interesting here because it's that exact effect turned up to 11. It immediately drops a lot of temperature but then stays super consistent. And actually after 20 seconds it's already doing better than all the glass beds which at that point continue dropping in temperature. As I take the fan off the Ender 3 it immediately jumps back to its initial temperature and actually exceeds it because the bed head started to supply more heat trying to compensate for the temperature loss up top. Fascinating how quickly the aluminum distributes temperature changes here. The Prusa having a steel core and a PEI coat is similar to the Ender, stays consistent after the first few seconds but doesn't recover as quickly. It's only a steel sheet and not a chunk of aluminum as on the Ender and steel doesn't perform nearly as well as aluminum when it comes to thermal conductivity. And here is the graph for all of that. So what do we learn from this? Well, I think a few things. First of all, all of these heated beds work. They all hold down your regular old PLA prints just fine most of the time. Looking at temperature distribution though, it's clear that on basically all these printers, you should stay away from the very edges of the bed unless you just have to print something that won't fit on the print bed any other way. It's also once again clear that having any sort of aluminum heat spreader in a bed is always a good thing. It spreads heat out evenly as the name implies and if it's the last layer up top, it also makes the bed very resistant to cooling from drafts or fans. Aluminum also doesn't warp much if it's the only structural layer in a bed, as we saw within the 3, simply because the temperature difference between top and bottom is evened out so quickly. Now, on the topic of warping, the way I solved warping in my FR4 PCB based bed back in the day is that I had modified the Marlin firmware to include a bed power output windowing function. Okay, so while it was trying to hold the temperature on the heated bed, it would learn how much power it needed to maintain the temperature and then only allow the bed output power to swing in a much smaller envelope. So instead of going from no heating power for a while and then swinging back to full blast for a few seconds again, which would of course create that temperature difference between the heated and unheated side again and warp the bed, 
It would first start out at, say, limited to between 20 and 80%, and then close to, say, keeping the output power between 40 and 60% at all times. Worked really well. So I think a bouncy bed is something that could be solved with software over time or just with a better PID tune. But it's always better to have a warp-free bed from the start, because if you don't know what you're looking for, the inconsistent layers that produces are basically impossible to diagnose and fix. So what would my perfect heated bed look like? I've actually already got it, I'm almost done rebuilding it. Uh, Mendel 9000 test platform. I've been using this heated bed for years, a viewer had sent me this PEI coated aluminum sheet, it works beautifully, and this was way before Prusa started coating things, and it's got a high power silicone heater on the bottom. I've got the same aluminum and silicone setup on the Cerberus Reborn Delta. E3D make their mortar beds in much the same way, but skip the adhesive, which, as you could see on the old spot mini, tends to bubble up. And I think that's really the best type of heated bed. If you don't care about a removable flex plate, that is. Uh, aluminum PCBs are much of the same and work just as well, and are probably easier to get made if you're manufacturing a product, while the silicone heater mat and milled aluminum is something that's easier to build yourself and match into your printer projects size and spec-wise. But then again, glass also works, you know? It's just not the best material for these. And yes, this is one of those cases where there is a best approach. I usually try to avoid saying this is the best one, because it depends on what you're trying to do. But in this case, aluminum is just straight up the best solution. Well, silver, gold, diamond, carbon nanotubes, and graphene would have even better thermal conductivities. Not sure why people aren't building heated beds out of those. Um, well, that's going to have to be an investigation for another day. For now, I hope you learned something. If you did, I'd appreciate a thumbs up. If you want to see more videos like this one, click the subscribe button and don't forget that bell. YouTube actually shows me which videos people actually subscribe on, so that's a really good indicator for me on what content I should make more of. And if you want to help make it happen, consider supporting the channel with a dollar or two on Patreon. Much appreciated. All right, thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.